Ow. Hey, everybody. We're live. This is our sixth episode, I believe. And it is with great pleasure and honor that I announced that Will Riccardella will not be with us today. And um, Will's apparently recovering from a bad case of the clap as well as genital, genital crabs. We all wish him the best. Um, they also got into his beard, too, so he might be shaving off the beard. Sorry about that, event. That's just the latest I heard from the uh, med center. Um, but we're going to go on without Will. This, I think this is the first time we're going to have not Will not here, so we'll do the best we can. Uh, we, we have some of our usuals here, as well as another uh, guest of ours that is, uh, we are very, very happy to have. First, let me introduce Mike Lee in the upper left there. He's the admin at Being Liberal Logic. And currently, the only member of the panel to have a beard. Uh, Mike, are you thinking about growing it out a little more? Are you thinking about shaving it? I mean, it looks good. A vet likes beards. Yes, we do. Women like beards. It's, uh, should I elaborate? The, the only way I would Mike? shave it. <clears throat> the only way I would shave it is if the hipster trend to grow beards continued indefinitely. Then I might think about shaving it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep it... Uh, Keep it until I die. Even if you got genital crabs in your beard like Will does, would you still keep it? I mean, those things are all over the place. On for, on, Will, Will's just a little careless. That that won't happen to me, so I don't have to worry about that kind of problem. Will, that stuff's routine for Will. That won't happen to me. That, that we can make, I'm sure of it. Like, we don't, we don't have to make you get rid of those those crabs. I'm just saying. Or the, yeah, the beard. We can make you get rid of the crabs and keep the beard. So, to, uh, science... What are you drinking there today, Mike? From Europe, I should add. I always add that because people might notice a little bit of lag between Mike and as well as he's a little bit more feminine than the rest of us because he is European. So what are you drinking there today, Mike? I'm, dr I'm drinking Leffe. It's got more alcohol than every drink that you're drinking. And I'm only going to be in Europe for 23 more days. No, no, 20. Wait, hold on. Let me math. Oh, 26 permanently more days. You're coming back, you're coming back yep. permanently? Yes, I am. So 26 more wow. days. Well, that's good news. And in the upper right, we have Yvette Guinevere. Now, Yvette, in case you all don't know it, I have my uh, – I've been given the research on you. It says here that you are the <gasps> world-famous food babe. I'm the what? <laughs> Tell us about being the, the food babe. What? Food um, babe? My note says you're the world-famous food babe. Yeah, you're the food babe. You know, the one who's always calling out M Monsanto and saying how our, our GMOs are evil and stuff like that. Here. Is that who you are? I think I, I think you have it mixed up. I'm the science babe. I'm the science babe. You're, oh, you're this is the opposite of food babe. The, the absolute intellectual oh. opposite of food babe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I kid you. you. We are honored to have you with us. You are the world famous oh. science babe. Of course, everybody knows you. And we are going to be talking about a lot of the topics that you hold dear tonight. So stick with us, folks. We will be talking to her a lot tonight. And then we have Maddie Palumbo. Okay, Maddie, I got to go through your all your credits here. Um, Matt Palumbo, author of Conscious of a Young Conservative and In Defense of Classical Liberalism, admin of Being Classically Liberal, contributor to the National Review, Fee and rare. Um, and I have a correction to make, too. Matt, you're not 13 years old. I, I don't know how this rumor got started. I don't know who's been spreading this I rumor. I spread it, Kevin. I don't have any clue. I don't know how that happened, but I, I, I see, apparently I've been blood. contacted. I don't know how, but... I, well, I was contacted by your lawyers who told me to cease and desist with this rumor. <laughs> so I have to... Uh, I have to tell the world right now, you're not 13. Nine. How old are you? 23? 21. 21. Okay. Oh, you just turned 21. That's right. So you can actually drink on the show. Yeah. What are you And I'll go back to you. Yvette. I forgot to find out what you're drinking, but Maddie, what are you drinking? Uh, you going. Keep it an American. You go. What is it? Yingling. Oh, Yingling. I you love Yingling. You. By the way, which was not even legal in Connecticut where I live until this year. So That's I can good. actually have Yingling now. 
So yeah, good stuff there. Yvette, what are you drinking? I know you got something a little like bit stiffer than what these two ladies on the left neat. side of the screen. It's of course. It's, ah, I, I bourbon, like, right? I, I like a bourbon. Nice stuff there. Um, are you it's drunk at this bourbon. time, or will you be drunk it's, soon? It's, I mean, uh, it's only four in the not afternoon quite sure. here, so just enough to make hanging out with you bastards tolerable. Just saying. <laughs> Ouch. So you're sort of hung over from your it's morning California. drinking, there, but you're starting to get drunk from your evening drinking. Here. Is that what's going on? <laughs> we won't get into that since this is a family show. Um, but, and I will say I'm Kevin Ryan. I run Unbiased America, which is a website that's biased towards libertarianism, I've been told. And today I'm drinking Russian Standard Vodka. Mm. I will be pouring a glass for myself right now. So as I do so, let me just say that today we're going to be talking about some science. Well, I have a beer too, but that's my backup beer just in case I finish this whole bottle of vodka. Um, because it's not easy dealing with you fucking morons. So, <laughs> so anyways, everybody, let's toast. Nostrovia. This is to uh, Beer and Bastards, and I want to welcome everybody who came out to watch the show. And let's get started. Our first topic, um, we're going to talk about the FDA today, the Food and Drug Administration, which um, you may or may not know is involved in approving or are rejecting just about every new type of food and drug in America. And um, they're, they've been a bit of a controversial um, department in the government in that their process for making decisions, especially on new drugs, has been very slow at times. And there's a lot of people who are ill with cancer or other diseases that find out about new medicines that are on the, the, the drawing board and they want to take those medicines. They want to, they want to, they, they've signed their waivers, they want to take them because they're dying essentially, but the FDA won't let them. Um, in some cases they do, there isn't an exception process, but in a lot of cases they don't. Um, and the real question is, and a lot of Americans don't even acknowledge this, is the FDA good for the public? Um, a lot of people think that they're saving us from possible would-be bad drugs and during the process of their, their um, approval process that they're stopping us from great harm. But are they, in fact, stopping us from great harm? Who wants to start off with this one? I'll start with this one. All right, Maddie. I know you've written some in your book, one of your books, um, in, the in Defense of Being Liberal. I believe that was the name of the yes, book, correct. In Defense of Being Liberal? Yes. Correct. Yes. So, okay. um, um, well, according to um, the FDA's estimates, they estimate that their regulations save 1,000 lives a year from preventing bad drugs from entering the market that would have ended up being harmful. But it doesn't take into account the opportunity cost of what would happen if good drugs enter the market sooner. So on average, it costs about a billion dollars for pharmaceutical companies to get a new drug approved through the FDA, and it takes about 10 years. So if there's a drug that could, let's say, save a thousand lives a year, but it gets delayed 10 years, well, then the FDA is really just breaking even at that point. Um, additionally, it's a billion dollars that they have to pass on to the consumer through higher drug prices, and basically, and well, since uh, they only have a patent for, I believe it's like 17 years or 20 years, whatever the end is, they have that smaller time frame to compress the extra billion dollars in pricing onto. So um, I think those are probably the biggest problems with FDA regulation right now. I don't think it's saving lives, and I think it's probably making drugs a lot more expensive. Uh, additionally, if there are any drugs, or sorry, any diseases that a very small percent of the population have, um, it's much more harder for a pharmaceutical company to bring a drug to the market because I mean, it's just a billion dollars they have, to they have to recoup just from regulations. But if there's not a lot of people who have the disease, they might not get it. They may never break even just because they have the regulation. So uh, I guess that's my beef with the FDA. But. I mean, does anybody have a, contrar a contrarian view to this? Because there's a lot of people in the public who – Probably most people, I'd even venture to say, believe that the FDA is one of the few good 
um, organizations in the government in that if it wasn't for them, then uh, the greedy capitalists or the, the drug companies would just be throwing out any sort of type of medicine that would be killing thousands of people and they'd be doing it for profit well, because nobody knows any better. Well, Other than, a, you know, there, to there have the FDA. There is a group that's doing uh, exactly that without the FDA approval. It's called the supplement industry. Um, or is anyone here familiar with uh, someone called the wellness warrior? Uh, Jessica Ainscoff. She, uh, she so, no. was, and I mean, this is, if you walk uh, down the, the supplements aisle at the grocery store or at a natural store, uh, someone in the, in the comments section just, just wrote, yes, she died, cancer. Um, so if you walk down the supplements aisle and pick up any of these bottles that say um, that something will give you vitality or cleanse your liver or anything, um, and then you see a little uh, line with an asterisk um, that says, uh, you know, this, these statements aren't evaluated by the FDA. You know, people can claim anything without showing that there's scientific proof um, as long as they just say these statements aren't evaluated by the FDA. So we do um, on some level. It, it's a good thing um, that we have, uh, you know, a, some regulation before something gets to market because you have to show some reputable proof that your product is effective um, and is not harmful. Um, now, the reason I brought up Jessica Ainscoff is because, um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her last name, um, she got uh, this very rare um, epithelioid uh, sarcoma in her arm, and they told her, you need chemo, and you need, um, uh, what should I call it, and you need to amputate your arm. And says she chose to go with Gerson therapy, um, which is, you just, you just drink green juice and you get coffee enemas. Mmm, delicious. It makes me crave a, a pumpkin spice latte right now. Um, but she, uh, you know, she told her mother to, to, to use the same therapy um, for her breast cancer. Her mother passed away, spoiler alert. Um, and years later, um, when Jessica finally confessed to all of her followers, to many of whom she told to, she'd sold um, this therapy too, sold her 10 day detoxes too. And, you know, just because she hadn't died yet, um, she'd said that this was working for her. Um, she passed away, of course, because of her cancer. Now, you know, if you say we don't need the FDA, we don't need someone saying um, that this, it, that these uh, treatments are, um, are, are reputable um, or, or verified as, um, as something that can work. Um, then we're going to have people who are just selling uh, um, cures. Now, the reason that we have this asterisk saying these statements aren't or have not been evaluated by the FDA, whenever you see something like that, you know what it means? No fucking medicine. It's not fucking medicine. So when you see um, a site like that, when you see someone saying it's natural, when you see a site saying um, you know, that they're selling an, a natural treatment, um, and years later, um, these people are dying is because they weren't using real medicine. Now, the, the approval process by the FDA, it may be long. Um, there are, as you said, you know, it takes a lot of time, um, and there are, are a lot of hurdles to getting things to market, but that's because sometimes you'll put a lot of years into testing something in rats, and then when you move to your first um, trial in humans, you find it causes damage in humans. So, I mean, a lot of these things are to safeguard people from damage um, or from, from harm. I mean, um, you'll find that a new cancer drug works wonderfully. Right. Well, um, um, but then, I mean, you were saying the risk, put the risk on people, um, sometimes to safeguard, uh, what's going call it, the companies from lawsuits. Um, you know, it's uh, from the libertarian point of view, let the person take the risk. Um, but it's, as we remember with Vioxx, uh, Viox, there were actually doctors in the room saying this shouldn't be put to market because when you add up all the compound risk that a person can be taking, it's going to kill people, um, and they still pushed it through to market. So, I mean, it's, it's again, like these companies do have a lot of risk on their shoulders when they put a new drug to market. They put billions of dollars into researching. So, I mean, is the FDA a valuable uh, um, branch of government That's to have? Uh, yes, probably because they need um, uh, what should we call it? Um, pardon me. They need to have an approval process uh, before um, a drug gets to market because otherwise people are going to have fake cancer cures sold. We've seen this happening. This is not just this is not um, an example I'm pulling out of my ass. Uh, this is something that happens regularly. I, I gave a talk on it last week on fake cancer cures, and if you Google. Um, fake cancer cures, or if you Google natural cancer cures, this is a growing industry, un unfortunately. So having, uh, and I mean, if you Google natural treatments, there, there are a ton of them. Um, so, I mean, having the FDA 
having it, uh, um, something that, you know, a, an approval process, not a bad thing. Maybe pare it down a little bit. Um, maybe have the approval process take less time. Um, one way that people can get in on these trials faster, um, people can sign up if they have um, uh, cancer, if they have an orphan disease, um, is to get in on drug trials. Now, something you did mention was they're, um, they're finding drugs for these smaller uh, for these tiny little diseases. I have an orphan disease. <laughs> I, I really take offense uh, to the thought that one of my uh, um, diseases isn't uh, worthy of, of a company uh, spending their time and money on researching a way to make my life better. So that's... Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to... I'm not saying it's not worthy. I'm just saying that, like, you know, if the company can't turn, let's say, a billion dollars in revenue from... Yeah. Like, the, uh, it's, I mean, I have... I mean, the cost of complying with it. Like, I have celiac disease. Um, well, I'm just yeah, saying that you, I have, I'm just saying because of the cost of regulation, it, it increases the amount of revenue they have to bring in from the drug. I, I mean, I mean, it wasn't the point. I, I, was, I understand I what you're saying. The, uh, the, yeah, the, no, the no, amount no. of regulation does okay. make the first few years of something is on the market. Um, it makes the cost of it higher. You have to go through it. I mean, we could get into a discussion on insurance all day, um, yeah. but let's not. <laughs> That's another fucking show. Um, but you know the. Uh... Well, let me just let me just inter let me just interject here that uh, something that you have to keep in mind, and that it's a great counterpoint, by the way, of that. Um, but to play devil's advocate, something you have to keep in mind is that, as Matt said, there there's a huge uh, expense associated with bringing these drugs to market and going through the trial process. But as you said yourself, Yvette, pare that down, and perhaps you get some sort of a compromise between. Uh, a process that assures that the public is safe and one that's too long that ends up with people dying waiting waiting for uh, a, a pill I mean, to be developed. And I'll it, just quote a, a couple of things. These are, these, you know, right. So. These are a couple of these are a couple stats I have from um, two books, uh, James uh, Bovard Shakedown and Dr. Mary Ruert, Healing Our World, as well as a couple of uh, sites I have online. If you want to go to Unbiased America, I have the actual um, citations here if you want to follow along, but 22,000 people died waiting for the FDA to approve uh, streptokinase. I'm not going to be able to pronounce these things, but it's a drug that dissolves clots in the heart in heart attack patients. 22,000 people died waiting for that to be approved. 8,000 people lost their lives while the FDA was reviewing uh, a drug that reduces gastric ulcers in arthritis patients. Um, a five-year delay in approving SEPTRA, an antibacterial drug, cost 80,000 lives. A three-year delay in introducing uh, propranol, propranol uh, the first beta blocker, uh, resulted in 30,000 deaths. 3,500 cancer um, victims died waiting for waiting three and a half years it took to approve Lucarin too. All right, 150,000 heart patients died. I mean, there's it, it goes on and on, and then. The book contends that the FDA, the only real drug that that killed Americans on a wide scale, on a large scale basis, um, before the FDA, was a drug called, uh, well, sulf. You know the name of this. I can't uh, pronounce it. Sulfonat, sulfonamide, whatever it is. Uh, it was a poorly researched, researched drug. Yes, that resulted it's in the, de the deaths of about a hundred people. Now, people trade off a hundred people. Works. Pre FDA for well, 200,000 well, people that, who died waiting strong, for drugs. I, I don't know if straw man's the right word for it or not. Well, that's the thing. We didn't have a lot of drug discovery happening before the FDA. So I think say, comparing those two, it's apples to kumquats. Um, so that that's a bit of a well, that's that's a, a a bad comparison to make. Um, but I, I, it's here's the thing: having the FDA because drug uh, discovery now is so much more complex. We're discovering drugs that are a lot. We're discovering next generation seizure medications that come with a lot more, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, um, with, with, that come with a lot more side effects. Like I'm on a seizure medication now for, uh, for my headaches. They come with a laundry list of, of, um, of side effects, one of which um, is aphasia, which makes me forget words occasionally, which is why you're going to hear me stutter once in a while. Um, but I mean, they have to really research these so that before they get re uh, released to the public, they could say, this is what we know. I mean, the last round of, um, of testing for drugs is with 10,000 people so that they can say, we know this is what it looks like when we release it to a lot of the population. Sometimes these drugs go out to a million people, and even with 10,000 people, 
you don't know what it's going to look like when you give it to a million people. You're going to give it to people with different types of allergies, with, with extra conditions that weren't in the 10,000 people. That's why when Biox hit the market, we saw deaths. It's because we didn't have people with the same conditions that we saw in those trials. So, I mean, we try to get, um, I say we, like I work for the pharmaceutical industry. I don't, I never have. Um, but like when, when we get them uh, into these trials, we're not seeing them with the exact same conditions as we do when we release them uh, to the public. So, I mean, it is um, an attempt for public safety. If people want to get into the trials, um, you can. Um, and I mean, you have to sign a lot of waivers. Um, but sometimes I think, unfortunately, people are put into trials um, kind of as a, um, if you, sometimes they put uh, healthy people into trials. And I think that's unfortunate because sick people really should be the ones in these trials. Um, I, I hope I didn't speak out of term on that one because I'm not sure how often that happens. But sometimes they, sometimes they put healthy people in no. just to see what side effects are. Um, and that's unfortunate. Mike, Mike, uh, to go to you, do you think that a vet's stuttering problem is due to uh, some problem she has or is it due to her bourbon use during the day? <laughs> Probably a combination of both, really. Oh, no, it's, it's, I never had a... Mike, what do you have on this topic? You got anything for us? Well, I, I just think that it's, it's kind of weird to me, I guess. I, I'm listening to some of the arguments here. I really... I really like what Matt had to say. It's kind of hard to follow up what Matt had to say, but when we were talking about a vet, she's saying that uh, you know it's good to have an organization that's kind of looking out for the safety of the drugs because you know if uh, there's not an organization like that, some bad things can go to market. But she also was saying that during telling a story about how there was cancer treatments that are out on the market. And there's a whole movement going on trying to expose these cancer treatments. Well, why hasn't the FDA stopped? these cancer treatments from being perpetuated on the market, they're still out there. There's not an approval process, sure, but the FDA hasn't stopped the, hasn't stopped these companies from making anything. It's, it does, oh, it's not FDA approved, it's still on the market. In the 90s uh, allowed all of those to become unregulated. And I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say to, to re-regulate uh, that because we know, uh, know how as, as libertarians we feel about re-regulating something, but at the same time, um, you know, putting these things onto market and just putting a tiny little asterisk basically allows these companies to, to, I don't want to say lie, but to not fully represent themselves effectively uh, to consumers like homeopathic medicines, which uh, you guys know me, you know my opinions well, on homeopathy. Um, these companies will put uh, um, little, uh, they'll, they'll put things saying this will help you get over flu-like symptoms faster, um, will help you sleep, and they're sugar pills. These homeopathic the remedies are just sugar pills, and because I mean, yeah. of, uh, all, 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 all that's... in the 90s that basically allows these medications to exist outside of the FDA, um, there's like there there's nothing that that stops this, um, and, and it's it's unfortunate that this is allowed to happen. Um, and I think it's not. I don't think we need new legislation. I think we need to repeal the bad legislation that lets the uh, the supplement market um, exist without uh, the FDA's oversight. I think I don't I, I don't I don't see a different topic. And it's go ahead, Mike. Finish up. I'm sorry. I, I just I actually just don't really see how that addresses Matt's argument. You know, we can sit here all day and say that the FDA saves some people from bad drugs, but Matt's argument is that while that might be true and while they might have a claim to saving some people from bad drugs, in the process, the burden of the process causes other people that could have had access to drugs that never got out on the market causes more people to die than they save by regulating it. Yeah, so I don't I don't really see how that addresses it. Okay, well, there's an ask. I don't see how that addresses Matt's point. Yeah, my whole argument was a cost. Yeah, Matt, let me give you the uh, There's obviously uh, benefits to the to the FDA. I'm just I arguing just, the cost of the benefits. No, I do I do see what you're saying. It's I mean it, there has to be a way to let people in on uh, on a drug while it's still in trial, I guess there has to be a waiver process to say you can't sue the company um, while it's still in trial. I know that there was, uh, I think, some sort of an Ebola vaccine that was being tested, um, and it, it's someone asked, you know, what would you do if you were in that situation um, offering the vaccine? I'd say they'd have to sign a waiver that they cannot sue the company because it's not approved yet. Um, it's that's, I think, if I were, you know, it's I, I were Grand Puba at the FDA. 
Um, that's what I do. I'd say, look, they can try it out while it's still being tested. They cannot sue the company, though, because it's, it ha doesn't have the stamp of approval yet. Um, I, it's Look, I mean, the job of the government is to just fucking be paranoid. So, like, if you're the most paranoid motherfuckers on the planet, what do you do? You you, you lawyer the fuck up um, and you say you can't release it until it's been, you know, proven as safe as possible. But, you know, in this case, if people are dying, say, yeah, you can try it. We don't guarantee anything. And we're uh, and we're trying, you know, really hard not to screw this up. You want to try it? You can't sue us. I, I think that's the only thing they could do. Like, yeah. put yourself in the like position. That idea. Well, there, like it's that's the that's there the is actually an approval process at, right? that there there is an there is an approval process that um, allows companies and people to sign off on waivers that would allow them to uh, try uh, a medicine that is in the is still has not been approved. The problem is, like you said, Yvette, there these companies are afraid of being sued. Yeah. So I think a, a little of a lot of this goes hand in hand with some tort reform because there is a lot of lawsuits out there that make these medicines far more expensive than they would otherwise be. And there's got to be there's a trade off between the ability to sue a company that has not adequately, like you said, gone through the discovery process and decided what works and what doesn't work and a company or a process that takes too long. There's got to be a trade off. And in some cases. It, it seems a little bit random. I've read stories about uh, people who were dying and um, they were basically begging for uh, treatment from a, a drug that was being approved and the company itself decided they would not allow them to be treated. The patient then either dies or frankly goes to the media and says they won't give me this drug and sometimes they get the drug. But anyways, I want to move on um, to, to the next subject, um, which is kind of related, I guess. Uh, public officials, um, and this is again another topic that Avet has written about on her. Uh, what's your blog called? Cybabe. Just throw in a makeup. Cybabe.com. Uh, that's right. Cybabe.com had a great blog entry about public officials and their obligation to the public when it comes to discussing scientific issues, um, specifically those who work. I want to talk about those who work for the government. Um, in government capacity, they're often using the bully pulpit to publicize a topic, a scientific topic or a debate. Um, do they have an obligation to stick to the scientific consensus on this issue? Do they have the obligation to basically, let's say, for example, there's an issue out there, climate change, for example, or some other issue like it, where there's a pretty strong scientific consensus. Do public officials have an obligation to convey the scientific consensus to the public? Or, um, or are we seeing instead um, a lot of people coming out and basically trying to get votes from telling people what they want to hear? And there's a huge industry in the US, or there's a huge, uh, I should say, opinion, uh, an argument in the US over whether or not climate change is real. And you have literally like maybe 50% of America and I'm taking this stat out of the thin air, but I'm in my in my experience, 50 percent of America doesn't believe in climate change. Um, and yet 90 plus percent of um, of scientists do believe in climate change. What is the obligation of our public officials? And I'll start with you, Yvette. What's the obligation of our public officials in discussing scientific issues? What is their obligation to the I public? I think it's to, to speak what the truth is um, according to science, because I understand um, that they're not scientists, but I don't think uh, that they, they should be saying that there's a debate when there isn't. This is not, I mean, I mean I, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm, my background is in chemistry and forensics. Um, but I, I think that, um, like, when you go to, um, I, I think that saying that there is a debate um, in climate science or that there's a debate with vaccines uh, to the public is like saying that there's a debate um, in terms of how you treat uh, cancer um, amongst oncologists. It, it's just not there. Um, like whenever they say we want to present both sides, there's it's just false. Like they're it, it's it's misleading. It's it's kind of trying to sell a comforting narrative uh, to their people uh, for votes, and it, it's not. Um, I don't think it's a, the correct way to go with this. I don't know if it's pandering for votes. I don't know if it's 
um, if it's for political points. And I'm, I'm, I never want to speculate on what's in someone's heart or mind um, when they uh, when they're talking about climate change. Um, or I mean, so every so often you hear a politician bring up vaccines. Uh, there was one, I think it was a Nevada congresswoman um, who said that cancer is a fungus. Um, it's just not, I mean, every so often, um, I, I know that either throat cancer or cervical cancer can be caused by a, va um, a virus, um, but it was, it was really, um, disheartening to me, um, to, to hear, um, you know, public officials just talking about this and you hear, um, uh, what's call it, Bill Maher, who's not a politician, but who's a, who, he thinks he's a comedian and he talks about political issues all the time, um, talking about, um, uh, you know, espousing pseudoscience. And it's more on the left than on the right that you hear them uh, being anti-GMO. So this is not just a right-wing issue, it's a left-wing issue too, that they'll talk about um, issues that are you just anti-science. And this is just, it, it drives me batshit. It's, it's inappropriate. Like before you talk on an issue about science and say this is hotly contested uh, or there's debate, please look up the scientific consensus. It's, it's not appropriate. Like I know that there's, um, there's going to be debate on economics until the end of time. There, there's going to be debate on how to, to lead um, on a social issue. But with science, look up the consensus, look up the research that's been done. Um, I think people deserve science. Uh, they deserve accurate science uh, from their public officials. Mike, is this debate driving a vet batshit or is she already batshit crazy? She might already be batshit. I don't know. You assholes. I don't know. I mean, what's the consensus of the four of us? Is she batshit? Should we look up the consensus on whether or not a vet is batshit? Where do we find that information? That's Good. Right. I mean, that's right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously joking, but the truth is that every issue, be it economics or science, has a, a majority opinion and a minority opinion. And you're never going to get everybody to agree. But what's the split? I mean, how do you decide what's the split? Mike, for example, um, in economics, uh, you know, is the, the issue of the minimum wage. I mean, you have until recently almost unanimous consent, I mean, not consent, unanimous uh, uh, opinion that minimum wage is harmful, that it hurts job opportunities and that it ends up um, affecting the people it's meant to um, help the most. But recently, there's been more of a split in terms of, uh, you know, economists coming out and saying, well, maybe let's take a second look at this. In other words, what's once unanimous sometimes ends up becoming through the process of discussion or even politicized, politic whatever, being politicized, it ends up becoming less of a um, consensus, consensus issue. Mike, is, is this something that spans... Uh, everything in terms of science, economics, or is this something that we really need to be very aware of in terms of defining what truth is and defining how much of a consensus needs to be, how much of a consensus does there need to be for something to be considered the truth? Well, it, it's it's funny. It's Consensus is really an ambiguous term. There's, there's I, I think it's kind of weird. This, this debate, especially with climate change, has gotten really extremely polarized. You have one group of people that is telling us that the world is definitely about to come to an end sometime in the next 100 years, and you have another group of people that are telling us this problem doesn't exist whatsoever. That's the biggest problem, is that's where the debate is. There is, there, is there a consensus that man-made climate change is happening? Yes, there is a consensus. I think it's, what, 97%? of scientists that have studied the issue say man-made climate change is happening. Where there is less of a consensus is how big of a problem it is. There's different models that are out there. The International, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change has different models that they use that tell us, okay, if these scenarios happen, then this is what's going to happen. If this scenario happens, then this is what's going to happen. The two scenarios that get publicized the most are the two extremes. There's one extreme where there's basically no change in public policy, no advancement in technology, and the world really is about to come to an end probably in the next century. And then there's the other extreme where uh, everything's rosy, great advancements in technology, government does this, this, and this, climate change becomes no problem. In the middle, there's tons of models, 
And this, I mean, and this isn't just some random organization. This, these are the people that are the authority on this issue. There's several models. There's no consensus or even attempt at a consensus on which one is most likely. So when we have the debate like, oh, well, you're just denying climate change happens or you're just, you know, that, that's a polarizing political debate. There is no consensus on what's going to happen. There's only consensus on what has happened. So I think that we need to first get all the facts out there before we have a debate that doesn't even really matter. That's a good point. That's actually a really good point. And when you look at something like climate change, which is what you are using as the ex example, um, yeah, there's a scientific consensus, but it's also become a politicized issue. And in America, at least, um, when something's politicized, you generally end up with a 50-50 split of opinions and that does not represent the scientific consensus so you might have say 97 percent of uh, scientists saying that climate change is real and yet in the public because we have republicans versus democrats and it's roughly a 50 50 split in terms of uh the the um, population you might have a 50 50 split on whether or not climate change is real and there's a lot of issues when an issue becomes uh politicized you have it right down the line. You have the left believes one thing, the right believes another, and facts be damned. And that doesn't just, I'm not picking on climate change. That, that goes for a lot of things like GMOs um, and other, any issue that's politicized, basically if your party tells you what to believe, you end up with a 50-50 split. Um, Matt, I'm gonna come to you next. Is there some sort of a is there is there some sort of a, a way that the public or the, the public officials should be dealing with this? Because the way I see it, in my opinion at least, a lot of politicians use these issues that are politicized to pander to their voters. And they, they essentially will come out and ignore the fact that there's a 97% consensus on one issue by, by the, the experts. And instead, they'll look at what the voters believe. And they'll say, OK, we got 50% of voters believe right. that climate change is fake or 50% of voters believe that GMOs are bad or whatever the issue is, do public officials have a responsibility to, to basically direct the public in the, in the right direction? I mean, I think when it comes to voting, they should more, I mean, I think they should go with what the scientific consensus says. Although, you know, as Mike said, it's politicized. So there's different models of climate change. Um, there's different strategies to combating it. I remember I was listening to John Stossel recently, and he was pointing out that climate-related deaths have actually been declining, even as man-made climate change is getting worse, just because, you know, we can adapt to it better. So, I, you know, while I think more often than not, we should go with, uh, I guess, a scientific consensus, uh, there are, I guess, sub-segments of the issue which could be debated more. Um, and I know you, Yvette brought up, I guess, Republicans and Democrats uh, being anti-science, and I guess I think you said Democrats are more anti-science. Um, I think they're both anti-science, but the issues the Dems are anti-science on are much more harmful. I mean, I think a Republican, let's say, not believing in evolution doesn't hurt anyone, but someone being anti-GMO or anti-vaccine is much more harmful. So that's kind of my opinion on the politicized versus the science. But um, we can debate all day long on which one's worse. Answer. But I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What was that? We, we could debate all day long on which one's worse. I think just being anti-science in general, like the, the liberals, I mean, I, 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 I think the liberals like to think they're the party of science. And then when you say, what about GMOs and vaccines? Uh, liberals don't like to admit that their party is the anti-vaccine party until you say, no, mm -hmm. no, no, the anti-vaxxers are all in California. I, I live here. I can call them out on it. Um, it's, yeah. and then when you point out the anti-GMO crowd, it tends to be the liberal hippie crunchy, uh, mm -hmm. party and they tend to be anti-corporation and that's why they're anti-GMO. Um, and I mean, the main spokesperson for the anti-GMO people is Bill Maher, who's always, he's on a show every week saying Monsanto's the most evil, big, bad corporation ever. They're smaller than Starbucks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really? 
Monsanto is smaller than Starbucks. Starbucks. They only make about like twelve to. I think they're only about thirteen billion dollars of profit per year. I mean, I say only like it's you know small potatoes, but like a thirteen billion dollar per year uh, company. That's not gi gigantic. It's not huge. Their, um, their market cap is sixty eight billion. Um, yeah, per year, so, their profit oops. is. I mean, I think last year their profit was, um, was about fourteen. Well, their billion. PDs. Whole Foods, makes about the same Whole Foods makes about the same amount per year as Monsanto. So don't tell me that one of these companies is the big bad guy when one of them is making the technology that feeds starting, starving people, when the other one is making $4 per bottle bullshit water. Like... By the way, I've noticed, I've noticed, and I, I want to segue here to the next topic, but I just want to say that I noticed that Yvette, um, one of her favorite drinks is a dog medicine that she drinks in the morning to get herself real stiff. Um, are you still drinking that, Yvette? Is that I, something I that of, you're still I, I maybe on? managed to get that pulled from the market by demonstrating that Edco shouldn't be getting your dogs drunk. It's a thing I do. I by the way, and the reason I bring this up is there's a there's a development on this issue, and I'm not sure you're what? aware of this, but apparently the, there's a development. Yes, there is a new product, wine for what? cats, and it's being developed as a way of saying don't drink alone. Wine for cats, and, and so you can drink with your cats, and it's it's a wine that your cat can drink with you, so that you don't feel like an alcoholic. You need to drink. send me the fucking link. Man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I never think you're going to I'll send, uh, I will definitely send you the link you're, after. I, I, don't. I will send you the link after, but it's right up there with, it's right up there with Catholic wine that you can drink during the day that you don't have to go to hell about. And it's, it's a good product. I just want you to just be aware of it and we'll, we'll get back no, to that anyways. Um, let me go to the next oh topic. You just. No, continue. What's no, your next My next uh, thing, I'm working on a video called Things Anti-Vaxxers Say. Um, and my video after that is going to be one, um doing uh, like it's because there are a bunch of other products like good dog out there um, that are 13% alcohol that calm your do dog down with essences of flour. No, it's the fucking alcohol. Um, so I was going to do a video uh, that's a spinoff of the Lucille Ball Vitamina Vegemin commercial um, that just it shows me getting drunk on all the, uh, <laughs> the good dog ones. And I'm really not a drinker like this tiny little thing of bourbon. Like I know it was there was more bourbon in it earlier and now it's me. Um, but I, I'm really not a big drinker. Like this is all I'm going to drink in like the next like month. Um, but it's, it takes very little to get me drunk, um, because of how little I like, drink. So the, the good dog is going to get me hammered. Um, or the, uh, cause there are a bunch of other products you in the market. Dog alcohol. You have a problem. It's about time you admitted that you have a problem. You drink dog alcohol. <laughs> Jesus, a vet. I mean, should we have? Should we? Should, we need an intervention on you. Anyways, let me move on. Let me move on. I got to get on to our next topic because we're running out of time a little bit here. But anyways, I want to just mention our sponsor. Um, the sponsor for tonight's shows is Phil Miserglocky's wheelchairs. Um, now equipped with computerized voice translation and endorsed by Stephen Hawking himself. Phil Miserglocky's wheelchairs. I'm glad to announce that they are our new sponsor. Phil Miserglocky. That's a Phil Long name. Are you aware? <laughs> Phil, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's our sponsor. He spent several hundred thousand dollars to be a sponsor for our show. Um, and he's got this line of wheelchairs that apparently are endorsed by Stephen Hawking himself. Trust and um, anyways, thank you very much. This is how we can have, this is how we can afford to have people at a vet on the show. And we don't have to stick I'm, with, I'm you know. paid? Bums like Mike Lee and Matt Palumbo, who basically we just send them, you know, hey, five, ten bucks per show. But with a vet, I, I'm yeah, getting... I mean, Matt's still living in his parents' basement, and Mike is still not even allowed in America. But we're all, you know, thanks to thanks to Phil Miserglocky, we can afford to bring a vet on the show, and this is her second time, and we just want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank Phil and a vet. So our next topic tonight is, um, this one actually goes to a vet. This is about Bill Nye. Um, yeah. Bill Nye has been infamous for take, his take on GMOs. Uh, he's claimed for years that they could be dangerous. 
And he presents himself, if you guys don't know who Bill Nye is, as the science guy who takes a stand that's pro-science and basically he's, he goes against people who he c come across as anti-science and yet he has this take on GMOs that goes against the consensus uh, of the scientific community. He had a take that went, went against the consensus. Backstage, apparently, after an appearance on Bill Maher's Real Time, Bill Nye said an upcoming revision to his book would contain a rewritten chapter on GMOs. I went to Monsanto, Nye said, and I spent a lot of time with the scientists there, and I have revised my outlook, and I'm very excited about telling the world when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And that's what he has to say. A vet, what's going on here? Has he changed his mind? Is he going from anti-GMO to pro-GMO? What do you know? What do you hear? Give us the scoop. Hi. I, yeah, that, I didn't hear the last hear little bit of that, but I'm guessing that's my cue to start talking. He's pro GMO now. I'm so excited because for a longest time he was um, he was anti GMO, um, and apparently he he went to Monsanto, and now uh, after spending some time looking at the technology, he's come around to our side, and he's pro GMO now. And it took long enough, but I mean, he said um, if everyone knows about the uh, uh, what's going call it the the the, um, the Ken Ham versus Bill Nye. Um, one of the biggest hallmarks of a scientist is saying evidence will change my mind. You'll, you'll put out a hypothesis and say, um, you know, it's I need to see whether this is or is not uh, uh, true. And uh, Ken Ham said nothing will change my mind about evolution. Uh, Bill Nye said evidence. Yvette, can you hear me right now? Change my mind now. Bring that, hold of on, course, to on. go back to the GMO We're getting issue. A lot of interference uh, Bill with Nye. Your connection here. Can you hear me? Hold on, Yvette. Can you hear me, Yvette? Oh, no. Can well, I was getting in. Hello? This is a cluster okay. call. You really, you really messed up. Hello? It might be the bourbon or it might be your, your connection. I don't Can know. You hear Usually me? this is what happens right. to Matt Palumbo, so I'm not sure how to handle this. I'm going to go to Matt just really quick. and let's. Okay, you can hear me. That's great. I'm going to move on to Matt because he's usually the one who has I can a really hear you connection. Now. I'll come back to you, Yvette. Right. I'll come back to you. Let's hope that, let's hope that those rolling... No, that's okay. We can hear you pretty good now, but let's hope that those rolling blackouts there in California don't affect the show worse than they already have. Matt Palumbo, listen. <laughs> Matt, listen up, buddy. Uh, I'm going to play with for a little while. I mean, while. what do you know about him? Do you think he's changing his mind? Did Monsanto get to him? A lot of people are going to say that he's getting shill Yeah. That he's being given money. by. He went out to there, and he was told excuse me, by Monsanto, that GMOs are good. And they probably gave him a little bit of money behind the scenes. Is that what your take is? Did that happen? Maddie, tell us the truth about what you think uh, happened. Well, prepare to be educated. I, uh, I mean, obviously my first reaction when he said it was Monsanto that convinced him that uh, GMOs were fine was that people were obviously going to be using that as a reason not to believe them. They're going to be saying, you know, well, if it's Monsanto telling him that, why should we believe them? On the other hand, whenever I'll make a pro GMO post, people will accuse me of being paid off by Monsanto anyway. So once I got to think about it, I don't really think it makes a difference. So either way, he's going to be he's going to be getting accused of being paid off by Monsanto. So eh. yeah, yeah, and he is already. And I've already read Mother Jones, an article on Mother Jones saying what did Monsanto give Bill Nye to make him come around to their way of Please. thinking. Um, Yvette, we'll get back. Hold on, Yvette, you're still pixelated here. You're still a little bit drunk. I think the bourbon's really Chill. fucked you up. Mike, let's go to Mike first. What's going on? I mean, is there, have you ever noticed a situation in which uh, big pharma or big whatever comes across and pays money to somebody like uh, a vet Guinevere, who we all think is taking money from from Monsanto anyways. Is there such a situation happening out there that you've noticed? Or is this just cap? Oh, she's gone. I lost her. <laughs> anyways, is this just capitalism? I know. Is this just capitalism? Well, I, are, are these companies allowed? Are these companies allow, allowed to give you money under the table to endorse their positions? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because Bill Nye endorsed uh, 
the deflate gate scandal that happened after the Super Bowl or before the Super Bowl, Bill Nye, Bill Nye came out with a completely unscientific opinion about that. So I think he was paid off in that instance. But no, I, I mean, I think Bill Nye is just trying to come out and be on the right side of the issue. He's made fun of, he's criticized people that have gone against the scientific consensus when it comes to evolution and global warming. And then he realized, well, wow, I look like kind of a hypocrite because I, I have not held the same position about GMOs. So in, in that sense, he came around and he decided, you know what, if I'm going to have these positions and if I'm going to criticize Ken Ham on national TV that he hasn't uh, realized a scientific consensus on one issue, how can he deny a scientific consensus on a different issue? I, I think that's mainly his motivation. I don't think he was paid off by anybody. I just think he wants to be right. He wants to be seen as right and pro-science in the public eye. And good for him, by the way. Uh, Mike, I know you're the admin uh, in terms of the technology here tonight. See if you can get, what's her name there, Yvette, back on the show. She's asked, she's begging to come back on because she disagrees with everything you guys are saying and she wants to explain her position. I'm, I'm trying so, right now. I'm uh, trying to get her back on right now. We'll see if I can get her on. Get her back. Oh, wait. Here hey, she comes. I'm back. There she is. I missed you guys. I was playing with a boob or something. Oh. Just one, though. You're playing with a boob? Just just, just one. I got, I got lonely. Okay, okay, we're sorry. <laughs> Only one beard on here tonight, so we know you're getting lonely. It's, Anyways, Yvette, what's going on with uh, what's what's going on with Bill Nye? So of course, everyone who's it's in science um, and whoever endorses GMOs, of course, has gotten uh, the the paid shill um, accusation. Uh, me, um, Coven Cinepathy, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kevin Fulta at Florida State University, we've all gotten the paid shill accusation. Um, Dr. Kevin Fulta, um, he's, you're, you're Kevin Ryan, not Kevin Fulta. Um, <laughs> it's, no, but I have too. I have okay, I've gotten the, uh, yeah, it's basically, if you endorse GMOs, if you endorse anything Monsanto, and of course, here's the thing, Monsanto is a smaller company than Syngenta. Um, it's, Monsanto's, it's smaller than Starbucks. It's not that big of a company. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very tiny. It's, I mean, it's not that big. It's just, they just get, a, I mean, Monsanto, like, March Against Monsanto is just catchier of a name than March Against, like, what, Stroll Against Syngenta? I mean, they're, you know, they're average sized. I mean, they made about the same amount, like, I already said this, they made about the same amount of money as Whole Foods last quarter. So, it's, I mean, they're not that big. So how could they be paying off all these scientists? I'm not sure how, like, if, if it's happening, like, why am I still driving a 2009 Toyota Corolla um, with 200,000 miles on it? Like, I'm, I'm That's not a good that. point. I mean, they make better, they make better cars for a lot less money now. Right? <laughs> I'm not quite sure why you are. Yeah, exactly. I, I should be doing something smarter with that. But no, I mean, if they're allegedly paying off, like there was one post online saying that um, Monsanto was paying everyone 60 cents per post um, every time that they posted something positive about GMOs. I'm like, really? You guys, someone, someone believes this stuff? I mean, like I'm, the Mother Jones article was nuts. I mean, I... I don't think, actually, the Mother Jones article was only a little biased, but the comments section was insane. People were like, they paid him off. What did they do in their lab? I'm like, they showed him the science, and he finally figured out it was safe. He came around to the evidence, which was wonderful, um, because he always said if he saw the evidence, he would believe it, and he did. It was, you know, it's a teachable moment that a scientist said he would come around to evidence, and he finally did. So that's that's that. So this is a happy story. This is a happy ending, because a lot of people... He, a lot of people criticized him for his uh, his take on this, and uh, I guess the point is, and the conclusion is, people can change. Yep. And uh, maybe it's a good thing that a scientist like Bill Nye or somebody who professes to be, you know, the public scientist can can actually come around and change on an issue. Of course, when the great GMO apocalypse of 2017 happens, he's going to probably be dragged out of his house and and killed. But uh We'll leave that for 27. They'll come for me first. They'll cut off my left tit and just burn it at the stake. Just the left one, though. It's bigger. Well, all you need is one. Like you said earlier, you just need to play with one. Yeah. 
Um, anyways, I just want. That's why I get invited. Anyways, back. I want to do uh, one. Of course, you get invited to, to the show. It's or this. I, I get, my tagline is "Come for the science, stay for the dirty jokes." I come as advertised. Do you really think people came to the show to see Matt Palumbo? Wow! Look at the kid. Wow. Seriously, he looks more like he looks like my grandma. <gasps> He looks like my Grammy. He's like 97 years old. I thought he was 14. He's, he's, look at well, this. I thought he was 13. Yeah, what the hell? No. 14. I gave you 14. I know. Well, I'm trying to start. I'm trying to start a new rumor. So you're 97. You're a 97. Year old Someone girl. in the comments section. And Mike Lee's coming back. To Someone in the comments section just said they thought I logged off to refill my glass. No, no, no. There's like nothing left, and I really didn't have it that full anyway. It's I'm just this weird sober. Yeah, bullshit. I. Yeah, bullshit. Show us the show us the dog medicine that has disappeared from your house in the last ten minutes. No, I'm just I'm I'm not a, I'm not really a that big of a drinker. So, like I said, I live in California. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sure you do. <laughs> Anyways, we want to get into lightning round tonight. Um, we have a few more s subjects that we want to get to, but we also want to take some questions. Um, Mike, you are what is that? Homemade root beer. Okay, Mike, you're the um admin. Yeah, I don't know what that was. Mike, you're the admin. What do you got there? By the way, we have one more sponsor tonight. I just want to mention. Uh, thank what, you to the guys down is... at Tollox. Hold on, one more sponsor tonight. The guys down at Tollox Bar and Grill. I just want to thank them. Uh, they all called in and they wanted to say thumbs up. Uh, Tollox Bar and Grill, and they are serving wings. Non-GMO modified wings, which we support because we, as they say at Tallox Bar and Grill, GMO will give you the shit. <laughs> so we we want to tell everyone to go to not to not to the Tallox Bar and Grill tonight, where they are having non-GMO you know, wings. Kevin, I don't think Mike gets that. Joke. Don't get the shit. Anyways, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. But anyways, um, Mike, what do you got for some questions tonight from these this rabble and on the side, who's been barking up and down? What the hell's wrong with them? They're asking questions. Our only questions, getting a little our only questions are really from our sponsor. I mean, yeah, we got Frank in here talking about minimum wage should be, or Francis talking about minimum wage should be fifteen dollars an hour because that's a living wage. Yeah, Francis McCloskey? is talking about Is that climate Frank change. Yeah, that's Francis McCloskey talking Don't about how people have to make a him. living wage. Don't worry yeah, about McCloskey. Uh, He's He's, he's not. Let me put this one on air. We, I mean, we, <laughs> some of these have disappeared. I've been trying to put them on air. The legalization of marijuana is certain in some states. How much research is being done in those states? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that question is, but it's not one from Francis, so I'm fine with it. Yeah, all right. Let's, let's talk about that, actually. That's a really good question. Let me go to a vet who right now, whose face looks like a little wheel that's spinning around. Um, I think uh, we might have lost funny. her. Yeah. Oh, there she is. A vet. A vet. A vet. Marijuana. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? I, I got for a second there. No, she's frozen again. Yeah, I'm not um, even think. What do you have? There? Is that science dog? Is Am that side dog? I don't know what side dog. Yeah, she's, she's. Oh, no. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Is that science dog right now? My dog broke the podcast. Can you hear me? Has science dog ever eaten? Has science, yes, science dog ever eaten a hash brownie? This is science dog. This is Buddy the science dog. Buddy. Yes. What do you know? What do you know about? Not the that research I know of. That's, I got him as a two-year-old, so maybe he, he did that before is, I got him. Will, he's, he's a very anxious. Uh, with the legalization stuff. of marijuana in certain states, so he's very how much research now. is being done in those states? Well, I'm aware that in Colorado they found that um, cannabidiol, uh, one of the, um, the non, t it's a, it's um, not, uh, what should I call it? It's, I'm looking for the word for it right now. It's a compound in marijuana that's not THC. 
Um, it's not psychologically or not uh, pharmacologically active, so it doesn't make you it doesn't make you crave cookie dough. I don't have another way to phrase that. Um, it works on seizures actually. Um, so when they distill it out of um, out of the marijuana plant um, into an oil, it works on Dravet syndrome. And I mean, this is a really severe um, type of seizure disorder. Um, that basically, I mean, it can um, make life unlivable, and they found that it, it's, I believe, your base syndrome. I don't know if it turns people into vegetables or if it can basically kill them um, um, by the age of 10, but, I mean, there was this little girl called, uh, I think her name was Charlotte, and this story was featured pretty heavily on CNN um, a couple of years ago, um, but this little girl, Charlotte, um, she was dying. Um, I mean, it was, she was at the point where she wasn't speaking. She was, uh, she was having seizures. I mean like 30 some odd times a day um, and the like they tried all the normal seizure medications um, and they finally said fuck it we're moving to Colorado to try out the strain of pot um, and here's the sad part they can't leave the state um, because if they do um, they'll be drug trafficking like this stuff has taken her from someone who couldn't uh, walk because you know she was so developmentally uh, disabled because of the severity of the seizures to, uh, to someone who maybe has one seizure a week. Um, and she's walking, talking, wants to go out and explore the world. Um, and she's, uh, and she can't, she can basically only go to states where medical marijuana is legal. So, I mean, it's, uh, THC is great for, um, whatchamacallit, for nausea, for pain, um, and for, I, I guess for certain anxiety disorders. Um, and for getting someone's appetite up when they're going through chemo, um, and can and the cannabidiol is good for uh, for certain seizure disorders. But I think when people claim that it helps with everything, it's, it's not a panacea. That's when when the uh, the medical marijuana advocates lose me. I, I really think it should just be legalized because I don't think it's any worse for people. Uh, I, I actually think it's less bad of a way to fuck someone up uh, than alcohol. But I, especially there are definite medical. Uh, uses for it, um, and I think we're we're causing Mike harm Matt, to the research for that. that high right um, now. That <laughs> if, if we keep it illegal, it's especially for people like Six little Charlotte and yeah. for people who have Dravet syndrome. She's not well. She said she was going to wear I mean, a certain red dress on the show tonight, and she didn't, so I had to lower the rating from an eight to a six. So yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah, no, I, uh, I don't know what my yes. audio is. Mike has Matt misunderstood the question, and my audio is really shitty. I was so, so busy. I, probably did I got a call from my agent. I'm sorry. But, it was busy. That's okay, Matt. Nobody cares what your answer is. Mike, what do you have to say about medical marijuana? What do you have to say about marijuana? What do you have to say about anything? I, I have a lot to say about medical marijuana, okay. and I have a lot to say about marijuana legalization. I'll just break it down really quickly. Uh, Medical marijuana, some of the claims that are made by some of these groups are completely unproven, but some of them have legitimate research to back them up, not all of them. I don't think that really matters, though. As Yvette alluded to, I think it should be legal anyway. I don't think that matters that much. I think uh, it's a less dangerous drug than alcohol or nicotine or anything like that, so I don't really think it really matters what the research says. If people are thinking that it... Uh, that it helps them with something, then that's fine. I think it should be legalized anyway, and if research determines later that it helps you with a certain disease, well, even better. Uh, that That's just uh, my basic 30-second opinion on marijuana. I just think it should, prohibition on it should end in general. In my opinion is... What do we got for one, let's, let's do, go ahead, cool. Matt, but let's, while we're listening to Matt, yeah, exactly, Let, let's, while we're listening to Matt BS on an issue he has, knows nothing about, <laughs> Mike, why don't you why don't you find one more you're question okay, from the viewers that we'll go to after Matt's done verbal diarying this subject? Matt, what do you got about All this? All right, well, I was going to next issue. Oh, you okay, want whatever? Okay, maybe maybe Matt's parents maybe Matt's parents just entered the room, so <laughs> switch the subject. Uh, we got anything else from uh, from the uh, the irrelevant people on the right who are spamming questions at us? Well, a lot of the people on the right are not asking questions in the actual question section. They're asking them in the chat. So Francis, unfortunately, is one of the few people that is actually asking questions oh, so in the actual question session. 
I so I'm just gonna put this on air. I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters at all because but that's the I don't really care about any of these questions. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this one is for a vet too. I mean, is there a scientific methodology or theory to explain why women find men with beards so sexy? Is it I think my my answer is it's just because it's a difference. Brown cow. I mean, the reason men find women's breasts so sexy is because we don't have them. Oh. Well, most of us don't. I, uh, and I mean, it's the same thing with beards. They, no, it's a secondary sex characteristic that shows that women are uh, capable of, I, I don't know, I read that it was because they're capable of feeding your young or some bullshit like that. I don't know. I I think tits are fucking fantastic, but that's just me. Um, but it's, what about beard? You, you just got why, to look at what? There's a so, chance that she could never I mean, mind. Moving like on. Uh, but yeah, tits are the best. tits are like the best thing in the history of things. But let's. Uh, whew. Of course. Trust me, there's only like I read several recently. hundred thousand people watching. It's not a um, big show. Go ahead. Can can I get a can I get a little filthy right now? Like, is that is that allowable on this podcast? Because they feel better during. What about stubble? Feel I haven't shaved in a few sex. days. I mean, is that? Better? <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me it's worse. There you go. That's why. <laughs> I I just like beards. I think they're great. I I I don't know. I, I that's I, I just like beards. I just always have like the uh, the the Cyprof, Look at Mike um, smiling up there. Uh, has one beard and board. I like it. But I liked it beforehand. I think he looks. I've seen pictures of him without a beard, and I hope he never shaves it off. So. <laughs> So I am. Um, I like beards. I think they're it's they're a horrible fucking way to end the sexy. Show, if you have a beard, have I there. probably think it looks Number good. Number one, I don't have a beard. So it's. I think so, that men you know, all I'm never pretty much get rock with a woman beards. Ever again, I, I, so I grow them out, Jen. Matt has not been able to grow a beard ever. So true story. <laughs> Thanks, but what about Matt? Poor Matt. I think He's, you're. Matt has never Kevin, even had a whisker on his face. You're fabulous and life. sexy and anyway. You're basically you're, insulting. You don't need your beard, baby. You're fine. So the side prop is perfect for me. So. <laughs> All right. Anyways, listen. I want to. I want to thank you, Yvette, as usual, for coming on the show. This is your second time on the show. When I he hits puberty, and he can have a beard. Okay. Fantastic. Psy babe like, is the is the name. It's okay. Don't worry. Not food babe, as our as our uh, researchers got completely wrong. Food babe's totally different and it's so, no, psychotic. You avoid food babe. If you ever do anything, don't watch food babe. Sci babe, science babe, Avet Guinevere. <laughs> That's right. Matt Palumbo, of course, uh, from just about everything. Thank you for joining us. And Mike Lee, who's going to be back you. in America very soon. Thank you. I don't know why, but welcome back soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, except for. Um, Except for those people like Francis McCloskey, who are psychotic. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Adios. We'll see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern.